screen. That look good? Looks good. Okay, great. So just want to give everybody an overview. I know most of you know the Cotton Board and Cotton Incorporated and some of the differences and whatnot, but just want to kind of dive in and, and see uh, some of the small differences and how we kind of work with each other and, and can relate to each other and whatnot. So like I said, I'm the Mid-South Communications Manager, so I cover Tennessee, um, Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and obviously Tennessee. So look forward to working with everybody. So we're start as you he you've heard from most of us at the cotton board. Uh, we are the ones that actually collect the grower assessments from from the upland cotton and things like that. So we're the ones that collect the money, make sure everybody's compliant as far as the gins go, and things things like that. So uh, we also administer the programs and uh, and put together some of the budgets and kind of do the projections to see uh, maybe what the budget's going to look like in the future year or two and things like that. Uh, probably the funnest part of the job so far, I mean, I know I've only been in a couple of weeks or three weeks, but really looking forward to communicating with the stakeholders and uh, really getting to know the people that actually have the boots in the dirt and really uh, are clothing everybody throughout the nation and, and everything like that. So really excited to kind of get to know uh, the stakeholders that, that keep the program going. Uh, the research, actually comes from Cotton Incorporated. So we kind of contract with them uh, to actually do the, the hands-on research um, as well as promote the cotton and, and drive demand for uh, not only the producers, but also make sure that the consumers such as uh, big brand stores and kind of, um, you know, big brands and, and different kinds of companies that actually uh, clothe or make the clothing and things like that. So. They're the ones that actually kind of do the marketing and, and so on like that. And, uh, and then we are governed from the USDA. So most of the media posts and most of the different uh, posters and the different publications we put out, we do run through the USDA to make sure everything looks good. Uh, and then we're portraying the cotton emblem, you know, as it should be. So uh, Cotton Board is based out of Memphis, Tennessee. And, uh, and then Cotton Incorporated headquarters is in Cary, North Carolina, but they also have different offices in New York, uh, Mexico City, uh, Hong Kong, or Japan, and uh, a few others across the, across the pond and things like that. So uh, they're really well diverse and, and put in really good places to, to drive the demand and kind of know what's going on. So as I said earlier, we, we do collect uh, assessment on all upland cotton that is grown and ginned throughout the US. And that makes up for a little over half of what our assessments or our total budget comes to. So um, I guess that would be the one that most of you all are the, the most familiar with. And then we also collect an assessment on all cotton products and cotton that is imported into the US. So. That's something that's new or newer compared to the, the original assessment, but that makes sure that we, we kind of know where the cotton's coming from and make sure that all the, the cotton that is moved into here, we still continue to, to use that money for research and things like that. So uh, something we do pride ourselves here at the Cotton Board is a 99% compliance rate. So it's, I guess, better than any other commodity uh, in the nation as far as just having the compliance for the, the checkoff money and for the assessments. So uh, pretty, pretty excited and proud of that. And that also helps us keep uh, a true budget or makes us, lets us be able to, to really understand how much money we have to deal with and, uh, and things like that. So we can kind of be more fluent with the budget and things like that. So speaking of the budget, uh, we're going to be operating on an $80 million budget this year in 2021, which is down $8 million from 2020. Uh, but that's mostly due to production as well as acres being down and, and obviously price being a little lower than, I guess, average. But hopefully we'll see that go up along with the other commodities as well. So what, why we're here today is for the uh, Cotton Incorporated State Research Program or the State Support Program. So uh, seven and a half percent of those assessments 
collected uh, go back to the state and goes to localized research projects. So um, each, each state is allocated their money based on production, um, how many acres, you know, how many bales come out of those different states and things like that. So uh, really kind of depends on how productive your state is or how uh, many research programs and things like that. So um, all of the research is determined by committee. So we have different people on the, the research committee, such as like you know, the cotton board members, cotton incorporated board members, researchers, and then different CPOs within the industry as well. So they all get together and, and kind of decide what exactly research programs that we want to decide to, to fund and, and move forward with. So um, all the research and projects are managed by Cotton Incorporated Ag Research Staff, which we'll hear from here in just a little bit. So in case you ever need any questions and you can't get a hold of me or you, you might run across some other folks within the, the committee members, these are the state support members and mostly uh, Cotton Incorporated board members as well as the Cotton Board. So uh, I'm not going to go through there and all that, but do appreciate everybody on that list and, and what they do and how they continue to support not only the Cotton Board, but Cotton Incorporated as well. So couldn't do it without these folks right here. So I kind of kept it short and sweet, but here's my uh, contact information. If anybody has any further questions or need, uh, need to know anything or reach out, feel free to shoot me an email, call me on my cell phone, uh, just however you need to do to get, get a hold of me and be glad to, to either get you on a tour so you can understand a little bit more or to, to just answer any questions as far as state support and things like that go. So uh, with that, I guess I'll turn it over to Ryan and uh, we'll get to dive into some of the actual research projects. Thanks, Grant. Uh, did that come up fine? Looks good. Uh, I'm Ryan Kurtz. My, my primary role at Cotton Incorporated is, is uh, directing the entomology research program, but I'm also the liaison for each state support committee in the Mid-South. And today I'm just gonna give an overview of, of the Tennessee State Support Committee, um, how the process works on selecting projects. And I'm gonna give a brief overview of each project that, that was funded in 2020. And uh, just for expectations, I'm not, I'm not trying to dig into the weeds and actually provide y'all with, with detailed management information in this presentation. Uh, that information is going to come out through the extension service in uh, Tennessee. I'm really just trying to give you all an overview of the types of projects and where the money is going in Tennessee. So just to get started on how projects are select selected and the accountability process for the various projects and, and uh, principal investigators. So the Tennessee State Support Committee sets the priority areas for the, the cotton research and outreach. So <clears throat> they set the, the priorities. There's a call for proposals each year, and it's basically sent to, to uh, the University of Tennessee. Proposals are, are returned to us. Uh, I make sure the committee has access to them. I also provide them to my counterparts at Cotton Incorporated. I'm, I'm in entomology. We've got all the other disciplines covered. Um, we as project managers review each proposal and provide feedback as, as, as requested from the committee on whether or not we feel that these proposals have solid scientific merit, if there might be ways they could be improved. But <clears throat> we're just providing advice. So the state support committee members have complete discretion on which projects are funded in any given year. Uh, due to the, just our requirements, projects are only funded on, a, on an annual cycle. But we, the committee does recognize there's need for multi-year projects. So in general, if a project is funded, unless there's extenuating circumstances, it's going to be funded for at least two, if not three years. Um, in terms of accountability on <clears throat> staying on task for each project, we require quarterly and annual reports. So we, we invoice or we are invoiced quarterly for work performed during that quarter. A progress report has to be submitted. If there's not a progress report, we don't pay the invoice. Um, also, it, 
Tennessee typically has one meeting a year in the summer, um, usually in July. At that time, the various research scientists and extension scientists give an in-person presentation on project accomplishments, as well as it's an opportunity for them to provide a, um, a they can kind of pitch their new proposals to the committee as well. So funding levels in uh, 2020, there was a total of $121,000 available for, for research projects in Tennessee. The, this funding level is set on a, it's a five-year Olympic average based on bail production out of Tennessee. So it, it fluctuates from year to year, but um, the last few years, it's been in this, in this $120,000 uh, range and as Grant mentioned, that's also um, it's it's the bail production, but it's just a percentage that goes back to the state, seven and a half percent. There's also a larger pool of money nationally that's the core research program, and there's a we I think last year 2020 we had, we had an additional 11 core projects that were also funded in Tennessee in addition to the state support projects. So before I get started in the actual presentations, I just want to call two resources to your attention. If you do want to find out more about which projects are funded in Tennessee, you can Google Cotton Inc. State Support, and that'll take you right to a page where you can select from each. You can look, you can see what's funded in all the other states as well. But click on Tennessee, and it'll have a, a list of which projects are being currently funded. Uh, Ed Barnes is our ag engineer. He loves these QR codes. If you like them too, you can just take a snapshot of that and it'll take you right there as well. We also have a website called Cotton Cultivated to where we try to bring together all the resources from around the web that are, that are beneficial for cotton production. This is not specific to Tennessee, it's more national, but you can filter by region um, to, to narrow down on information that's specific to the Mid-South. Um, this is where you find our weekly weather video too. If you haven't seen that, definitely check it out. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty informative. So jumping right into the projects. So for 2020, uh, these are the projects that were funded in, in Tennessee. Um, most everything was through the University of Tennessee, but there was a Tennessee Ag in the Classroom that was funded through Farm Bureau. And we've got everything from insect management, weed management, more agronomy type projects um, and to, to ag engineering with Lori Duncan and then Tyson Draper's uh, broader um, extension program. So starting with Scott Stewart, the uh, um, objectives of Scott's program and particularly this project is to provide support of extension and applied research activities as it relates to cotton insect management. Um, Obviously, there's great opportunity to minimize the impact of cotton pests um, through pesticide use, but if we use them more judiciously and looking at implementing other pest control tactics involving IPM, we can really reduce the amount of inputs that we're putting in and increase profitability through their judicious use. So this extension project aids crop managers in decision making by providing quality information on IPM and resistance monitoring. <clears throat> Scott's got a very large program. There's no way I could go through it all. Just going to hit the highlights of some of the, uh, the results from his research and activities as it uh, relates to, to last year's project. For thrips, thrips have developed resistance to acephate. Um, it's, it's occurring in numerous other areas of the Mid-South, not just Tennessee, possibly other insecticides as well. But Scott's finding the commercially available in furrow and seed treatments are, are adequate unless it's under very high pressure situations. Another thing to keep in mind is that, that low seeding density um, or low seed, seedling density will increase the severity of thrips injury. For tarnished plant bug, he's done a number of trials and basically you know, with proper insecticide selection following the, the recommendations from the university, infestations of tarnit plant bug can be managed to preserve yield. Uh, for bollworm and tobacco budworm, BT cottons are providing adequate protection against low bollworm pressure situations, but a foliar insecticide applications are sometimes going to be needed for on two gene cotton, and that's either due to some circumstances where it's just high pressure, but we've also got cry protein resistance. The, the two proteins that are in Bolgar 2 um, and the other and twin link and wide strike, 
we're seeing resistance to those in bollworm populations. Still no resistance in tobacco budworm. So oftentimes you're gonna to need to spray your two gene cotton. They have, they have rarely seen a need for foliary applications to three gene cotton, which is the, the newer ones, Bulgar 3, Twin Link Plus, Wide Strike 3 that contain VIP 3A. No resistance has been observed in that, in those, to that protein yet. Uh, <clears throat> next is Lori Duncan. Lori's primary objective was related to uh, uh, evaluating constructed wetlands and trying to assess the potential for them in ag production in, in landscapes in West Tennessee. Uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, flooding is becoming a, a more serious issue in Tennessee than it has in the past. Climate models are predicting that, that y'all are gonna receive 10 to 15% more spring rain in the coming hundred years. So Lori's really looking at, you know, can you appropriately design and locate wetlands on your farm to provide a temporary water storage for floodwaters and then a drainage system to have that water be released more slowly than in just the four inch rain in a, in a single hour type of situation. So the, the outcomes from that for this particular year is they've developed an online tool that categorizes parcels of land. And, and so you can assess whether that land is suitable to potentially construct wetlands for flood mitigation, um, allowing it to filter the runoff even better and potentially add waterfowl habitat on your farm as well. Uh, a secondary uh, 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 objective from this project was looking at the, the, the potential for remote sensing for nitrogen levels. Um, Lori was looking at, you know, can a, can a tractor or UAV mounted inexpensive camera look at the, the green color index and determine whether the cotton is, has sufficient nitrogen or not. Um, results from that were included in a recent extension publication that you see here on cotton nitrogen management in Tennessee. Next is the, uh, the one with Farm Bureau, the Tennessee Ag in the Classroom. And Chris Fleming heading that one up. Um, the objective is that is to provide objective information about agriculture through educational systems by developing and providing material, training teachers in their use, and then maintaining and continuing a liaison with educational institutions. And you know, why is this important? The public's pretty vulnerable to misinformation about ag's impact on the environment. Um, most people don't have any direct contact with anybody in production agriculture. So communication and education are proven means of reducing the negative impacts of misinformation. And generally in any year, this, this is uh, providing 56 to 60 workshops that are gonna reach over 1200 teachers. They're conducted by the Ag in the Classroom staff or consultants at various locations. And they typically reach 60,000 school children uh, across 70 county farm days conducted by the Ag in the Classroom program each year. Um, I, I don't have the exact numbers of what happened. I'm sure this was impacted to some degree by COVID in, uh, in, in 2020, but I know they definitely held a lot of in-person workshops. I don't have the exact numbers, but this is an ongoing project that we, the State Support Committee continues to fund, and this is the typical impact in any given year. The next is a, a trial with Heather Kelly looking at, at target spot and other diseases of cotton. Uh, the three main objectives here were evaluating seedling disease treatments, establishing sentinel plots for monitoring for foliar and virus diseases, as well as conducting fungicide evaluations. Uh, Tennessee's got the highest reported losses to seedling diseases of any cotton producing state. Target spot's a relatively new disease in Tennessee so they're really looking at trying to figure out um, monitoring whether the current recommendations are accurate and needed and how, what to, how to inform growers to manage this particular problem. Uh, also a new disease, CLRDV was first reported in 2019. They wanted to evaluate the potential in 2020 for its incidence and severity. So some brief highlights uh, on seedling disease. Her preliminary findings uh, are showing that uh, three seed per foot can yield statistically the same as four seed per foot when comparing across seed treatments. And an insecticide treatment plus a zoxystrobin fungicide in furrow can be pretty similar to a premium fungicide seed treatment. For target spot, 
it continues to be an occasional yield dropper in West Tennessee. Um, it, variety selection, location, history, and weather are all influencing whether this disease develops and its, its impact on yield. The initial analysis of canopy management differences investigated have not had a statistical impact on target spot or yield in Tennessee trials. And they're working on a, uh, uh, they're developing data trying to develop a better way to forecast and determine the risk for this particular problem in Tennessee. Um, next, uh, a bat Shakufa looking at drought stress. Primary objectives are looking at irrigation recommendations based on water saving potential by cotton variety and then screening varieties for potential drought tolerance. Drought is obviously one of the, the greatest uh, threats to cotton profitability. And she's really looking at how to better characterize drought status in a particular field and try to develop a more comprehensive understanding of how things um, work between variety, drought stress, and, and yield, and trying to prevent the triggering of irrigation um, when it's not needed, and then shifting it to more targeting where you can have the biggest impact with that water application. So her data are, are indicating that, that at, at specific times, you're gonna have a, a, a more profitable impact by applying water, at, whether it be at half an inch per week, early to late bloom versus um, an inch per week from bloom to open bowl under particular water levels uh, in the soil, looking at really targeting when to specifically apply that water. She's also seeing that certain cultivars have a higher water holding potential it had higher lint yield compared to other cultivars under rain-fed conditions. So her basic findings are that you know, you're the the the, um, the the variety that you pick, if you're planning to plant into rain-fed conditions, it could have a big impact on on your yield. Weed management has been an ongoing problem. Larry Steckles had a uh, has a great program. The Tennessee State Support Committee has been funding Larry ever since I've been involved in this. The key objectives for his current project are looking at continuing the ongoing work with growers to monitor for new herbicide resistant weeds. He's also looking at evaluating new management systems for control of glyphosate resistant palmer amaranth and developing best management practices to integrate cover crops as part of an overall weed management program for cotton. So why, you know, why is this important? Obviously, weeds are taking a big hit themselves, but the cost of management for these glyphosate resistance weed is, a, is an obvious threat as well. So it can obviously get over $100 per acre pretty regularly. So this program is looking at how to integrate cultural with chemical means to improve the consistency of weed management as well as reducing the cost of weed control. High level overview of some findings from 2020's project. Um, poor barnyard grass and jungle rice control was primarily due to dicamba antagonism of glyphosate and clethodim activity in extend cotton. In order to get good grass control, don't mix glyphosate or clethodim with dicamba. And uh, unfortunately, Larry has, has begun to document an early step by Palmer to evolve resistance to dicamba. Another <clears throat> project uh, on cover crops and planting dates. Um, the objectives of this project are to evaluate the influence of cover crop planting date and species type on various soil properties, yield, fiber quality, cover crop biomass, and weed suppression. Uh, so if you're trying to plant a cover crop, obviously the, the species or the mix and, and establishment are, are some of the primary management challenges associated with the use of winter cover crops. So this project is looking at evaluating, you know, how the different species and planting times are going to impact production in Tennessee. The overview of the, 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 uh, the research to date is showing that a rye vetch and a five species mix has significantly higher yields compared to the rye alone or no cover crop treatments, regardless of the planting times in the study. Uh, planting rye alone actually decreased yield compared to no cover control in this particular trial. Uh, both rye vetch combination and the five species mix re resulted in higher biomass and better weed control than the no cover or rye cover crop alone across planting dates. 
and the data indicate that if if um, if a producer must delay cover crop planting, using a species mix is better than than using a, a non legume single species to get a slight yield advantage. Um, and I'm going to conclude here with uh, Tyson Raper's extension project applied research program. We've got Tyson on the line. He can definitely take any questions if you have more for him on this or the, any questions more broadly about the impact of some of these, these projects in Tennessee. Tyson can help me out with that. And I will, you know, I'm happy to cover any procedural type questions as it relates to how the program is implemented. But Tyson's program, the main objectives are looking to research agronomic issues important to Tennessee cotton <clears throat> and extend those results in a timely and efficient manage, in a timely and efficient manner for the purpose of increasing the productivity, profitability, and competitiveness of Tennessee cotton. Um, the significance of this is to provide timely research and outreach efforts to keep Tennessee producers economically viable through reduced inputs, improved efficiency, and evaluation of the latest technologies, and then relay this information to growers and consultants in the allied industry for the betterment of the industry as a whole. Just a overview of 2020 deliverables from Tyson's program. He's got a, had a tremendous amount of work going on. Uh, there were over 3,250 <clears> 3, total plots established and maintained and harvested across 65 trials. This encompassed 170 research acres, 135 of that was on farm, 35 on the experiment station, and then processing over 4,200 seed cotton samples from through the, the UT microgen from across the belt. The extension program also resulted in 63 popular press and blog articles, 14 peer reviewed extension research articles and 25 pre presentations at extension events. So just kind of an overview of what's gonna happen next year. These were the projects that were selected for funding at the uh, 20, in the summer meeting in 2020 for funding in 2021. Most of the projects are renewals from last year of projects that I just went through, but I'll point out two new ones here at the bottom on invest, investigating soil compaction and another one to evaluate uh, potassium uptake at looking at fiber quality and lint yield response to, uh, to, to foliar potassium applications. And this is just a reminder, if you want to get more information about the Cotton Inc. State Support Program, you can Google Cotton Inc. State Support or copy down this address or, or click on this, this, uh, this code right here. And then just also, if you want to get more information that's uh, research that's valuable to cotton growers in the Mid-South and across the belt, check out Cotton Cultivated. With that, I will turn it over to, to, to Emily or, or Grant. And if there's any questions, happy to field them. Uh, Tyson and I will be happy to fill those.